So, homologous recombination. We should be familiar with the idea of homologous recombination from genetics and uh, being a source of genetic increased genetic diversity at the level of the gametes. Um, and we're going to talk, we're going to focus primarily on how homologous recombination is involved in non-gamete cells, so the somatic cells. Uh, the big difference is that this is going to be double strand breaks. Um, the UV damage, DNA addict repair, base pair mismatch fixing, the all of these responses, base excision repair, nucleotide excision repair, and SOS response are going to use single strand breaks or NICs uh, and maintain a template strand. Homologous recombination um, is an it's actually used to fix double strand breaks. Um, so the uh, genetic diversity that's made or that's produced by homologous recombination is um, important at chromosomal segregation at meiosis 1. But we're going to kind of gloss over that and think about how this fits with our previous discussions of DNA damage repair. Um, so when we think about homologous recombination somatic cells, we think a lot in the context of DNA repair. And um, for instance, the repair of double-stranded breaks from endogenous or exogenous stores, sources. So there are enzymes that cause double-stranded breaks, and then there are chemicals that can also cause these double-stranded breaks. Um, it can also be used to restart the replication fork at uh, when it's stalled or when it collapses. And so we'll focus on those towards the end of this lecture set. Uh, but this is, it requires re homologous recombination to fix these. And then finally, we can also have um, re homologous recombination to maintain the telomere in the absence of telomerase. Because, of course, our somatic cells don't have telomerase. If they do, they become cancerous. Um, but we can use homologous recombination to maintain some of that uh, telomere structure. Of course, we have to start out this whole discussion of homologous recombination and the idea of the importance to genetic diversity by mentioning Mendelian genetics. And so this is, um, of course, the Mendel was the father of genetics. And we are all familiar with the pea plants. Uh, he studied genes that were uh, passed along, inherited independently of one another. So uh, we wound up having flower color that was very uh, segregated perfectly from one progeny to the next and was very clearly um, related to passing on of a physical actual um, uh, gene, a physical stretch of DNA. So this is different than um, what we now know, or it's, it's a little bit more complex. Even though we do have some genes that are passed on this way, we know that it's a little bit more complex. And so in 1905, about, um, there was a study shown that some characteristics can be inherited together, whereas these are inherited separately, some can be inherited together. So when we have, we came up with the idea of linked genes. And when we have two chromosomes that have two genes that are not necessarily close to one another in the um, in the chromosome um, with no crossing over, none of this sharing of genetic material from one chromosome to the other, we get um, no crossing over, no uh, co-inheritance, no change in the genes um, that are being inherited. And so this is like what Mendel saw. But we know that um, we can have crossing over of the actual chromosomes themselves where one chromosome donates some of its genetic material to the other chromosome and vice versa. We wind up with crossing over and we get recombinant um, chromosomes. So this of course depends on the fact that genes are actual physical objects and this gene exchange, this crossing over does happen. Uh, so the key is that there's more frequent crossing over of genes that are spaced closely together on the chromosome. These are relatively far apart from one another. Um, and so these might not necessarily uh, be co-inherited. Um, so the uh, crossing over was first identified in meiosis, but we also know now that it, it occurs during mitosis. Another thing that we want to just point out here is this idea of gene conversion. And gene conversion is changing from one allele to the other. So we've got a um, uh, 
dominant allele for the M here and a recessive allele for the M here. And gene conversion is actually frequently associated with this crossing over process. And what happens is we start out with our um, two separate uh, chromosomes. Uh, we get a crossing over event, and the crossing over event happens close to the location of the allele itself. And in that crossing over event, we wind up having one of the alleles, the, in this case, the uh, recessive allele gets changed to a dominant allele, usually by some sort of small point mutation that's associated with this crossing over event. So this results in irregular segregation. Uh, and so normally we would expect, you know, two and two for, uh, we'd have two that, two of the gametes that would wind up with the dominant, two that would wind up with the recessive, but in this case we wind up with three with the dominant uh, gene and one with the recessive, and so that's called a regular segregation. Um, and again, it's the result of a base pair mismatch at some point during this crossing over event and um, linked to that, uh, the location of the crossing over event in the proximity of that gene itself. So the important question now is how does this actually, this crossing over event actually happen? And I think some of you, I remember, were familiar with the idea of the holiday model. And now instead of looking at two sets of chromosomes, we're looking at two stretches of DNA here. So let me preface this by saying, first of all, that this is just a model for how it happens. I don't want you to necessarily be explaining to me why it happens this way or even at this point the data that supports that this happens this way. I just want you to know these two models that I'm going to show you um, because especially the second model is um, how we sort of understand what proteins are involved in this process later on. So we have homologous chromosomes here, so a stretch of uh, DNA and a stretch of DNA, and these are homologous chromosomes, which means that they have the same genes in the same order along the chromosomal arm. So we got A, B, C, A, B, C. This one happens to have all dominant, this one happens to have all recessive. That's how it's laid out. Um, this, the key to remember is that these all have the same-ish sequences, right? Because we have genes and we know that specific genes are going to have similar sequences to other, the same gene in one person or the other. Um, that's the idea behind why we can do the Human Genome Project and know what some of the more irregular genes are that are um, associated with diseases. So, but we now have two stretches of DNA, and you'll note that we've got five prime, three prime, three prime, five prime, and that becomes important as we have our crossing over. So, in the holiday model, we have a uh, endonuclease cut in this three prime strand. Okay, so we've got a cut in both of our strands, and we have a homoduplex of our gene for or of our gene B. This means that all of the base pairs match, um, and you'll note that there's a single base pair difference in the dominant versus the recessive. We have T's and A's here, and we have G's and C's here. All right, so we've got a cut in both of the strands here, and now we're going to have a strand exchange. And the reason that this strand exchange can happen is because the sequence is very similar. So there is some base pair matching along this order. Now this itself, this X here, this is the holiday junction. This is where that exchange of uh, genetic material is occurring. So we've got the strand exchange and ligation. That means that the actual phosphodiester bond is created here and here. First we had Nick here and Nick here, and then now we've got a ligase that's ligating this together. Then we can have the potential branch migration. All right, so we've got the um, base pairing that's happening. So we've got hydrogen bonding that's encouraging this strand to be joined to um, this into this double-stranded DNA, likewise here. And now we get a heteroduplex DNA. So heteroduplex DNA means that we've got a slight base pair mismatch in this gene for B, um, the dominant and the recessive. We get the same sort of base pair mismatch here as well. And so this is introducing some of our um, genetic diversity because we have a base pair mismatch that can come along and be fixed. But anyhow, we have our branch migration of our holiday junction that moves down here. And we wind up then finally with this as our um, model or as our 
the way that our DNA is set up. So this is going to isomerize, meaning there's going to be a twist around here, and we wind up with this cross. Okay, so this is one of the things that everybody associates with the holiday junction. And the way that this resolves itself, i.e., the way that these four strands now that are intertwined by these two strands, the way that they resolve themselves is going to tell us, um, give us information about the A and C. We've already got this heteroduplex for B, um, but we're going to figure out something about whether or not there's crossing over of the A and C. Um, depending on how this fixes. So if it fixes north to south, so it cuts it, we've got endonucleases that cut here and here, we're going to wind up with a splice or a crossover. Um, and so we're going to wind up with the dominant C on this side and the dominant A here, the dominant, or the recessive C, recessive A. Remember we had dominant and dominant before. And we still have this change of B. Um, we can also resolve it in the east-west direction, so nuclease is cut here and here, and we get no crossover, so we still have the dominant and dominant, recessive and recessive, but we still have some sort of heteroduplex DNA in this spot here. So, again, I want you to just remember not how or why it happens this way. I just want you to remember that it happens this way and what the steps are. The same thing is going to go for the next model that I'm going to show you now, the Meselson ratting model of recombination. This is the second model of recombination, and uh, just like with the holiday model, I want you to remember that I don't need you to be able to explain why it happens this way. I just want you to be able to explain, explain that it does happen this way. Uh, the measles and ratting model of recombination is going to end kind of similarly to the holiday model, but uh, the big difference is that the, where the holiday model starts with single strand nicks in both strands or both chromosomes um, for recomb recombination, the measles and ratting is going to have a single strand nick on only one um, of the chromosomes. Um, so we start out the this model of recombination with an endonuclease causing a nick in the DNA, and there's going to be a displacement of the strand um, with help from a protein that we've heard of before, RecA. The RecA protein is the same protein that's uh, involved in the um, SOS response. Um, so it leaves a five prime overhang. So we get. Uh, the synthesis of this three prime end and we leave a five prime overhang. That five prime overhang is then free to invade another strand and so we this is in a D loop um, and I apologize that's cut off there but we get strand invasion from this original nicked strand it creates a D loop in the other strand. Um, the D loop is called the D loop, and just remember that it forms kind of a D here, um, and that's due to the invasion of the strand from the first nicked chromosome. Uh, after the D loop has been formed, it's cleaved off, and that strand is removed, and then the uh, invading strand is ligated in. There's a ligation across the holiday junction, and then it has to be resolved. Um, we can either have just ligation followed by resolution here, so we got the holiday junction there, and it's resolved either on the horizontal, that's the east-west, or the north-south vertical, and that's going to change our recombination, and you can see how the differences are, appear with the red and the blue chromosome here. Um, or we can have branch migration so that the branch itself is going to move, the holiday junction moves from here to here, and then we again have to have that final resolution with either the non-crossover or the crossover. And again, pay close attention to what colors are on either ends of these because that's what tells us if it's a non-crossover where we still have red and red versus a crossover where we have red and blue. There's been some of this blue material has been crossed over in combination with or in addition to the recombined um, bits in the middle. Okay, so that's the measles and ratting model of recombination and the problem is that neither of these models really explain how 
homologous recombination fixes double-stranded DS um, DNA breaks. Sorry, double-stranded DNA breaks. Um, and so there's a further model that I'd like to briefly go through as well, which is called the double-strand break repair model. The double-strand break repair model begins with a double-strand break in a single chromosome. So whereas the holiday was a nick here and a nick here, the measles and redding was a nick only in the blue, this one is a double-strand break in one chromosome. Uh, double-stranded break in one chromosome here. Um, this is uh, based off of a model that was developed using a yeast plasmid um, and they found that the yeast plasmid was going to use homologous recombination to repair that actual plasmid. Um, this double-stranded break here, whereas again holiday was a nick in both chromosomes, Muselis and Ratting was a nick only in the one, we've got now a double strand break only in one, this is going to initiate a recombination event. So first of all the um, break itself is going to get processed by resection to leave two three prime overhangs and we'll talk about how this actually happens later, I just want you to think about the global model itself. Um, these three prime over, uh, ends don't overlap and that's important as well. The three prime end of the single stranded DNA will invade a homologous DNA sequence to form another D loop here. So this is this should look similar and familiar from the Muselson ratting model. Um, the DNA polymerase is going to extend the three prime end here so we've got extension of that into the uh, um, previously invaded strand and that uses the non-D loop strand as a um, template. Then we have capture of the second end and what that means is the D loop winds up getting captured by um, the homology within the original strand where we have not only First of all, we have recognition in this area here with the second three prime overhang, so that gets captured by the D loop here, recognized by this sequence, and then this is used as the template to fill in that other uh, strand. Now we wind up with two different uh, holiday junctions that need to be uh, repaired, and so the resolution is that final, sorry, the holiday junctions don't need to be repaired, they need to be resolved. The resolution of the holiday junctions results in either a double strand break repair without crossing over, so again we've got red and red, blue and blue, or we have crossing over depending on north, south, east, west, where we've got blue and red and red and blue.